My name is Katya Gutierrez and I was a Jehovah's Witness for 23 years. Christian and I escaped the Watchtower organization four years ago. The reason that we want to make this documentary is to bring awareness to the fact that the Jehovah's Witness organization destroys families' lives. We know of hundreds of thousands of other people just like us who've also had their lives destroyed and their families taken from them. These are their stories. Hi, uh, my name is Coralie Latham and I was a born-in Jehovah's Witness for 34 years. Hello, my name is Mark Latham. I was born into the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society and I finally woke up at round about the age of 45. I was born in Cheltenham and that's where I'm still at, in yeah. Cheltenham, in, in the UK. Same here from Cheltenham and born just around the corner from here. I was born in. Was yeah. Born in. yeah, my grandparents oh. and my parents, and obviously I was in, I was born in, my children were born in, so yeah, yeah. Okay. all born in. So you're like a third generation? Or? I'm third, but then obviously our daughter is fourth, mm -hmm. so it's kind of, and it would have continued like that if we hadn't have left. So yes, we grew up with no Christmases, no birthdays, mm -hmm. no celebrations, no Halloween, none of those things. Um, like many other born-ins, uh, you grow up thinking that's the normal way of life mm. from a baby. Well, you, you don't know anything different. It's, it's sort of something that you, everything you do um, is based around what you're told you can and can't do. And so when you see other children, you're very judgmental. And I think that we've only just realized uh, leaving the witnesses, how even from a child, you mm. can be very judgmental about other people and other yeah. children. So that straight away puts you on the back foot when it comes to relationships with young kids. Mm. You, well, you're not allowed to have relationships with anybody else in in the same group or age group as you, unless there are other Jehovah's Witnesses. Sure. So I think it's quite hard for children to grow up in, in that environment. There is another level to that. Yeah. And um, it's only years later when I've been talking to other ex-witnesses. There, there are a number of children that have been brought up in the, in the religion, if you can call it that. Pseudo-religion. Who, who <laughs> Uh, their families weren't strong, so they didn't go to meetings mm. very often. Mm. And that was very much the case for, for me as a child growing up. So I wouldn't have the meetings, but I wouldn't have Christmas, birthdays, or any of the celebrations either. Mm. So it's a very confusing world to live in, uh, being told that those things were really bad to have. But at the same time, I wasn't being so-called spiritually fed within the Kingdom Halls for long periods of time growing up mm. and so it was a very torn atmosphere for a child to grow up in not knowing exactly where you sit with the world yeah. uh, when you look around you and see all of your peers your school friends getting on with life and enjoying it and being happy and having all the things that they want to say for a Christmas present um, you knew that wasn't coming your way but mm. also trying to understand why you weren't getting those things was also just as traumatic because you didn't have that faith mm. that you were supposed to have had as a child growing up. Or expected to or have. Or expected to mm. have. Yeah. Yeah. So that, well, that was yeah. that's hard. That that is what you're expected <clears throat> to do is to um, get to an age where you then bat get baptised mm. and then from in my situation being a, a, a sister, I the only option for me was to pioneer um, or to, to get married and have children and marry either a minister or servant or an elder that's the thing that you are aiming mm. to do mm. because that's the guide that's the guidance you're given um in order to well, that's the right thing to do and that's the correct path to take so relationships don't exist unless 
the moment you date someone, you're already married as far as some is the congregation is concerned. Yeah. So, I've something we've talked about is that you've there's so many people that just decide not to get married because they don't want to make the wrong decision. Mm. So there's many of the time people will rush into a relationship, get married because they want to have certain relationships. Then unfortunately, when they realise they're married, that that relationship then is. Um, wrong mistake. and it's a mistake and there's yeah. nothing they can do about it mm -hmm. yeah. and I think that having watched that a lot of people are then put off with making the wrong mistake um, or uh, the wrong decision in that and making a mistake and marrying somebody so they, they don't get involved at all um, with yeah. my situation the moment I started dating someone they had me married and, and that was it and I'm like oh okay mm. <laughs> so is being a pioneer as a sister is that like the top that's position you can ever get? Yes, unless you, of course you want to go on a little further and take it to being a, minis um, a missionary or um, we'll serve in Bethel. Bethel that would be, that would probably be mm. the next stage up, but that is high, that's as high as you can go. And even then when you are um, in a position where you're volunteering, you're, you know, you to do those positions, you, you're then expected to be able to support yourself as well. So a lot of the time with me, I, I had a, a cleaning, part-time cleaning job. And the part-time cleaning job was just to cover the immediate expenses. So it, I it is a uh, it's poverty. I was fifteen, yeah, when I got baptized, mm -hmm. and I remember sitting at the assembly, and we were to we were all asked to sit in a specific section of these, this um, auditorium stadium, mm. football stadium. Yeah, it zaps you completely of normal childhood. Yeah. So. Mm. And you, Mark, when were you baptized? Yes, 1988. I think I was 24. 24? 24 then. And, uh, but I'd already left. I'd already been out the religion a couple of times. Like I say, you've been brought up in and out, in and out. So, but I never got rid of the, the Armageddon doom. And that was the thing that kept bringing me back that I knew, because of my indoctrination that I had had, that I was going to die at Armageddon unless I was actually in that Kingdom Hall within the congregation as a Jehovah's Witness. Mm -hmm. So no matter what I did in my life, I could never be truly happy because I hadn't got the education to get out. And so you, you're constantly thinking about, well, the world's coming to an end. You'd watch the news and you'd see something happen. You think, I need to go back. Mm -hmm. And so they had a grip on me. The Watchtower had a grip that um, I didn't understand what that grip was. Um, and uh, many ex witnesses understand what we're talking about mm. when, we, when we talk about this sort of stuff. But as a child, the Armageddon Doom, uh, the Doomsday thing, was very much of a, a constant, daily, repetitive thought going through your head. Either you were in the organization and you were going to be saved, or you were on the outside and you were going to die. Mm -hmm. And so you live with that all the way through your tender years, into your teenage years, into your early 20s, and that's exactly what happened. So I ended up going back, mm. thinking it was the right thing to do. If I'm being honest with you, was I happy to go back? No, not really. It wasn't about happiness, it was just about making sure I was following my indoctrination. It was for the wrong motives, and of course, mm -hmm. when you read the Christian Greek scriptures, if you are a Christian, that's not the right motives for, for becoming a Christian in the first place. It doesn't work like that. It's far more simple, but the message is very, very clear about love mm -hmm. um, and not a survival technique, which is what most Jehovah's Witnesses have when they go in. I need to survive, so I must be in the Kingdom Hall. And that's exactly what was going through my head for all those years. That there was, um, there's a saying that we used to use as witnesses that if somebody left the organisation for whatever reason, oh, they'll leave, but they may leave the truth, but they'll never leave Jehovah. Jehovah will, it will, they may go, but they'll come back. They'll always return. The mm -hmm. truth never leaves them. The truth will them. never leave them. Mm -hmm. So they yeah. may leave the truth, but the truth will never leave it's them. It's an interesting so it's word, truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And it's a loaded word that they use, as we all know, with the word truth. Uh, gives off so many, I mean, it actually triggers a lot of people now when they hear the word truth. Yeah. Uh, but actually, it's, n it's, it's the opposite of truth. But it is, a, I see it like an encapsulation, a, a sort of sedative pill. <laughs> as soon as you hear the word truth, you go, oh, mm. oh, of course it's the truth. Yeah, so I've mm. got to come back. So you, you, you automatically, psychologically, have this thing over you. It's like an invisible 
barrier mm. that's on top of your head saying, oh, it's the truth. Mm. Yeah. It's almost like um, by using that word, it's like anything. If you say something enough times, then you actually start to think it's true. You believe it. And that's the, like yeah. pathological liars use the same thing. Mm. If they convince themselves that what they're saying is actual truth, they start to believe it. And I mm. think with the organisation, they've, they've, they've absolutely perfected certain techniques when it comes to making people yeah. believe something. And it's like it becomes almost robotic mm. and, and instant. And, mm. and, you know, if somebody says a certain word, because they're using that same terminology over and over again, mm you are convincing yourself it's like brainwashing you're convincing yourself that it is the, that it's the truth and i think that the organization have got that absolutely nailed when it comes to using loaded language yeah. and certain words and terminologies that if you say it over and over again it becomes part of your everyday speech to the point where when you're talking to somebody when you're a jehovah's witness and you're talking to somebody who isn't a jehovah's witness you have to explain what those words mean mm. Because it, to you, they're part of your natural language. To anyone else on the normal outside world looking in, it's not a language they understand. So, so. another example, the word organization. Mm. Uh, if you've been brought up in the truth, the word organization is another thing that you actually have encapsulated in here that you do not question it. Mm. The word organization means um, they have control of me. It means I don't question it. I don't um, rebel against it. I do exactly as they tell me. The word organization has so many compliances written within that word that only a Jehovah's Witness would understand mm. because it's a word that is constantly used on you. The organization have said this, the organization have said that. It's in your best interest because the organization have said it. Mm. And so you, you have that word organization in there just as embedded as the word the truth. And so you don't question it. And the minute you do, the elders then say, but it's the organization. And isn't it interesting how mm. by using the word organization, um, they don't have to say Jehovah said this. All they've got to say is the organization says, and people obey, obey it. And yeah. why is that? Why would people just obey the organization? Because it's that's what people are physically seeing. And that's the way that as Jehovah's Witnesses, you are almost led down to follow mm the organization the governing body yeah. god doesn't really come into it it's only when you sit back and look and realize that actually god had nothing to do with an awful lot of the things that were taught mm. it was the organization have now suggested we do this the governing body have given us this information to read not this has been supplied by jehovah god this is now information has sure. come through so it is very much without you realizing you are obeying an organization yeah not yeah. a god when you manage to free yourself from it you're not under its influence anymore and you do the education and you see the flip-flops the the doctrinal changes, changes that have taken place through the decades sometimes going back to the original um doctrines and then changing the other blood issue is a classic example of all of that but it shows this is nothing to do with a creator mm -hmm. a god this has got everything to do with man, an organization saying that we need to change that. It's not flavor of the month anymore. It's not working. Change it back to this or change it to that. And these constant changes are not something that you would expect from an almighty God. Mm. Uh, you really wouldn't. Mm. So uh, it's things like that. But then that's when you come back to this word organization. And then when you do that recovery in the education and you start to learn all of the things that they have been doing that they keep hidden from you, that you can now read on the internet. Yeah. You just suddenly realize that this organization is extremely uh, changeable. Yeah. And uh, why was I so compliant to it? Uh, what, I, what I agree with today might be apostate material tomorrow if they change their minds, which of course they are doing on a constant basis. Mm. So that helps free you. Mm. And, it's, and it makes you angry. It makes you joyful. It makes you elevated. It makes you sad that you've wasted years of your life following this rubbish. Mm -hmm. And I call it a dark deception. It gets people thinking dark and it's a deception. It's deception. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. not truth. Um, but ultimately you realize I'm free. Mm -hmm. I'm out of this rubbish. I'm out of the organization. I'm out of the so-called truth. And then you're on a pursuit of your own to mm -hmm. find out what your real truth is. We actually handed in our resignation letters to the organization on November the 6th, wasn't it? Yes. In 2011, a few years before 
uh, um, got married against the elders advice because they said for us to stay away from each other and why was that uh because i had been married previously and divorced my husband on other grounds other than adultery i divorced him on the grounds of unreasonable conduct and obviously in the in the um organization if you do anything in the way of leaving a spouse uh, for anything other than adultery then you can't remarry so in my case even though because i couldn't prove what had happened on my ex-husband's side of things um i i just wanted to get away from him in the end and decided to divorce him anyway they told me i wasn't in a position to remarry because i couldn't prove that i was free scripturally so when mark and i met and then eventually wanted to marry we weren't allowed to and we were told to stay away from each other even though we loved each other and we had children that wanted to make our family mm. a unit of one we but we didn't listen to that we went ahead and got married anyway um and they saw that as an utter defiance yep. and dis disfellowshipped us within a week of us being married yep. we were disfellowshipped a month Into after we were disfellowshipped mm. they had a letter proving that i was free that cora was free yeah. they had a letter yeah they even got me um when we were disfellowshipped um, to because we said why don't you just leave it in Jehovah's hands why are you putting us in a position of being disfellowshipped why can't you as elders stop judging just, us on just that. stop judging us and leave it in Jehovah's yeah. hands and they didn't want to because they wanted to make an example of us it was about congregation control that was their control. exact words we yeah. need to make an example of you mm -hmm. and we just thought this was ridiculous and that we were not going to let that affect us so mm -hmm. we we decided to um, get married and even though we were disfellowship we were going to attend every meeting which we did um, and we did that with our children sat at the back of the kingdom hall for three years and i think in that time when you're not being love bombed because the one thing the organization is very good at is love bombing people and and making them feel like they are part of something that actually you're not it's all fake it's very fake um, and they like to think that they're a unity of brotherhood and a bond of a bond of love they haven't got that they really haven't and you only see it when as we were put in the position of not having that love bombing but still attending the meetings sitting at the back, back of the kingdom hall, watching watching not allowed to interact yeah either ourselves interacting or people interacting with us they can't even look at you right no, no. you can't you are the disgusting We're, thing yeah. you are the unclean thing at the back of the kingdom well that's what we were told on the platform You're and he taught. pointed yeah quit and it was a special needs discussion for the congregation quit touching the unclean thing and because they, they felt very annoyed yeah. with the fact that we were t continuing to go along, even though we were making it really difficult for us. Without talking to anybody, smiling at anybody. We, we would come in late. We'd and come in leave, late, leave, leave before early. Before the meeting ended. But we were the unclean thing. What was, what was interesting to us with regards to um, our disfellowshipping, though, was once you are disfellowshipped and out of the congregation, um, you can apply to be reinstated and mark and i did that three times didn't we yep. over In the writing. course of the three years yep. and what that then involves is three elders that are usually the ones that were on your initial committee that disfellowshipped you would then turn up at your home and talk to you and decide whether you are repentant for your actions and whether mm. they are seeing enough humility uh, um, in order for you to be then accepted back into the congregation well you see because we were disfellowshipped on the grounds of unreason um, on the grounds that we were not obeying counsel they said they didn't disfellowship us because we got married mm. is because we didn't follow the council to stay away from each other so that's so how can that you was a gross sin but straight away um, i said to mark how can you repent from that yeah you can't ever turn around and say yeah. i'm sorry i didn't listen to you and i married him by the way, I'm really happy, but I'm. Do I regret that? No. So I'm not repentant. But we we yeah. applied three times, yeah. and each time they sat in our home, and each time they refused. But the manner. I wish I'd recorded those meetings, yeah. because the manner in which they came across will haunt me for the rest of my life. Mm. They they were disgraceful they didn't in care. the way that they conducted themselves in mm. the in those three meetings, that took weeks for them to to eventually turn up. But the way that they treated us in those three meetings was was absolutely appalling. Mm. And I'll never, ever forget it. 
And uh, the, I know who those three men are mm. that did this to us. Mm. Um, but every time I open my mouth to raise a question in a polite, non-demanding way, just a legitimate question, I would get the presiding overseer look at me and go, see? Not being humble. He's not being humble. What? And I said, all I'm doing is asking a question. See, you're not being humble. Basically, we were supposed to sit there and not, and not say, say a, word. a word and just look. And, and for three years, they enjoyed having us there yeah. in, the, in the palm of their hand. It was appalling. Not being able to, to do anything, absolutely say nothing that the would, that the would put them in the wrong, look, to, you know, or they've said the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. we, we had to tread on eggshells for three years and not even, you know, do anything to disturb anything. All the shunning and the disfellowshipping was, was hard enough as it was. But mm. then when you had these meetings, you were reminded that you are below scum. Yeah. You are below that. We can say what the hell we like to you now, mm. and you're going to have to sit there and, and take, take it. it. He even said, and one um, of the elders sat there and said, you're in an adulterous marriage. Yeah. And Mark said, his whole body went how de inside, how dare you? How dare you say that? It was inflammatory. I think when it was meant to actually make, make us angry. Yeah, it to did. To make us burst into something they can go, see? That's exactly what... It was all provocation it was very very inflammatory everything they were saying there was nothing forgiving about it there was no love no love there was no love to, to say we really want you back in the congregation there's no. no encouragement no you're doing really well we see yeah. that you are at the back of the kingdom hall it must be very hard for you but yeah. jehovah's smiling down on you or you're doing yeah. the right thing and eventually this will be um you know you'll be back in the congregation just keep going nothing they wanted yeah. us out they did not want they us didn't to want come us back, back. Yeah. there was the the slander as well um mm. that i was i was accused of having an affair with, with Cora's mum mum. <laughs> and and Cora's mum would then tell us later she said this is what's going around by certain sisters so I I wrote a letter to our judicial committee to say although we're disfellowshipped mm. we I'd like a meeting with you to get these people to stop doing this awful awful, awful thing mm. and um, eventually one of them turned up for a meeting and said I'm not going to do a thing because you're disfellowship. It's you're not part of the congregation. You're not part so of the congregation. But these are sisters that are in the congregation mm -hmm. and are slandering another individual. Yeah. Um, to the point of lying and defamation and all the other terrible things that they were saying that was hurting Cora's mum mm. as well. And that's that really concerned me. And yet I couldn't even protest because I was disfellowshipped. So uh, having not been loved on for three years, mm -hmm. um, that kind of gave us, I think, a wake up call, but we didn't realize. Um, although in that three year period, Mark had started doing a little bit of research and mm. I didn't know. But you see, all of this, as Cora said earlier, did something to us. It made us realize that although we'd gone through this fire with these people, there was a lot going on in the subconscious that made us realize we're waking up. Mm. What really is this organization all about? They made us strong because we were yeah. having to work it as a family unit. Our family unit became very strong and we then didn't need the congregation or mm. rely on anyone at all. Mm. And Trust I think that they, yes, and the relationships had gone. Yeah. So in a way they weaned us off of all of those relationships that you, you when you're yeah. a child Depended on. born into sure. it that you depend and that you, you rely on and that that's the only thing you know so the moment we were reinstated um, it was the, the beginning of the meeting this is how absurd it all is we were no different in our in the way we felt about any situation from the moment we got to fellowship to when we were reinstated so that three years was a complete and utter waste of time mm. because we didn't there was no repentance because what can you repent for yeah. As I say, repent for, for 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 not for not for marrying my husband. They were asking us questions, and they were asking us how we felt. How did we feel about the whole situation of being, you know, um, re reinstated? How did we feel about um, our situation now that we were married and in the organisation? And then they said that they'd had a discussion, the three of them, the elders, and that they felt that our attitudes were still not correct. And we said, hang on a minute. How how can you tell our attitudes are correct? Not one of you elders has spoken to no, us for a year. Not for over a not year. Not for over a year. Did one of them 
yeah. actually to, and the one elder wasn't even in the room having this meeting was only two elders this time round and one of them we've had a discussion with uh, brother morgan and he he feels that um your attitudes aren't correct they said i haven't even seen him for over a, over a year mm -hmm. what well, how can you tell someone's attitude when you haven't even spoken to them when you talk to people about Cherry's witnesses the one of the main things they say is oh they're the ones that don't accept blood transfusions they knock on your door on a saturday morning and wake you up and um and and that's pretty much oh but then really nice people that's all they have is a, as an image mm. that's not them at all all of the things like the shunning and the which we are still undergoing today we we get shunned by every single jehovah's witness that that we know um, and and that includes all of the family members that we have that are still Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm. Shun us. Um, shunning is a horrendous, horrendous thing. I mean, shunning, to be honest, it's like, it's the invisible wound that you don't see. So it's it's a slow death. Um, so I remember somebody actually referring to it as it feels a like slow a slow death. death. It's yeah. like they when they look at you or don't look at you or that cut that relationship off with you that they've that you've had with them before, whether it's a family member or a part of a congregation, um, it is like them stabbing you or cutting you, but that you don't see that cut or that. Yeah. So no one else sees you in pain or sees the damage that's caused, um, but the damage is a slow death. It's killing you it's in killing plain you. sight. Yeah. If you're in a supermarket and you're seeing a family member walking towards you and they completely show, and you can look at them and smile, because we, we always do that. We never follow their rules on this. Yeah. But they'll look at us and they'll just do that as if we're not there and they'll walk past. It's, it's killing your individuality. It's mm -hmm. killing your soul inside. It's telling mm -hmm. you, you do not exist anymore. You're a non-human. You're already You're a dead. You're non-entity. You're already dead. And why do they shun? What, what is it that they feel? It's like? a control thing again. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they, to be honest, I think if the organization were to remove the shunning policy, they'd have a, a mass exodus of people. They would. Because the, one of the re main reasons why people stay, one of the main reasons my mum, when we said we were going to write a letter to resign, she said to me, don't write a letter, just fade. And I said, but mum, it's living a lie because I do not want to be associated with this paedophile organisation that does not worship God. They, they actually are completely opposite. They draw people away from God. I said, I've never had a relationship with Jehovah. And if that is even his name, as I was at the time, I now know a lot more, but in my naivety, mm -hmm. even just talking back then, I said, I don't, I just, I just no. don't want to know mum anymore. Yeah. I yeah. honestly do not want to be known as a Jehovah's Witness anymore. When you're a young child taking on the responsibility of, of making a decision to get baptised into an organisation mm. that will put so many rules and regulations around that bapti baptism that if you decided you wanted to change your mind and walk away from being a Jehovah's Witness when you're older, not only will you lose your family, but you'll lose everything, including your identity, and they will make it the hardest thing for you. So yeah. it's it's your being baptised into something that you can never leave. That's the difference between a cult and a religion. When you get baptised, you, you also are baptising yourself with a great deal of faith mm. that this organisation, as we talked about earlier, is going to look after you. Yeah. Is going to become your comfort blanket. It's going to give all of those things together. But when it changes its doctrines, its policies, when you have uh, men, uh, elders in the congregation who are doing it for the wrong motives, who um, turn out to be not all the case, not all elders are like that, that's not, but a lot of elders that get the power trip become tyrants against certain individuals that they just don't like in the congregation. Your faith that you got baptized into, the faith, I'm not talking about faith in God, I'm talking about faith in the organization, is severely tested mm -hmm. and is put to the test because now you've got a conflict of interest. Your faith is destroyed by the harmful practices or the harmful things that can be said and done against you mm -hmm. by a group of men uh, that leave you destitute. So the organization isn't anything to do with the spiritual paradise. It's all about control, all about compliance. It uses fear mm. and it uses uh, shunning as, as a, the ultimate weapon within a family. Mm. 
And, and that is the devastating stuff that the people on the outside in the street don't see mm -hmm. when you're walking through a supermarket and you're being cut to pieces in your heart mm -hmm. because you're somebody that you love dearly in your family is now shunning, shunning you. you. You think mm. and hope that your isolated situation is that isolated. But since leaving, <clears throat> we have absolutely been influxed with people that are just mm. coming out with, that's exactly what happened to me. This happened to me, that happened to me, this happened to me, that happened to me. It is absolutely, you go to every, any, you remember how you could be sat in a Kingdom Hall reading a Watch Trying to Wake magazine and you'd be saying, oh, I can guarantee they're reading this exact same magazine in this country, in that country, in this country. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you now, you go to every single con congregation around this globe and you will find people that have been treated exactly sure. the same way yeah. because you think you're on your own you yeah. think you're the only person that's going through this and you are is absolutely not the case which yeah. is why i say if they were to remove the shunning side of things i think you would see a lot more people leave we were uh, decided to resign and we had them all around here to uh, so that we could actually just resign the questions that we put to them, all we, the, all we were getting back was, well, <laughs> you've got to leave that one with Jehovah. You've got to leave that one with Jehovah. You've got to leave that one with Jehovah. And we weren't that, we weren't that read up. We weren't that. Um, Not at the time. No. We weren't that well educated with regards to the facts yeah. about the the different things that the organisation had had, had um, flip flopped mm. over the years. It was horrendous. I mean, you would expect when you're going to someone who's your mother, at uh, her funeral, she was taken very young. She was only 54, uh, 56, sorry, 56 when she died. So that's a very young age mm -hmm. to suddenly, you know, lose uh, uh, one of your parents. You don't expect it. Um, so um, when I turned up at this funeral, I was treated like an outcast. I was treated like I was a non-person and mm. I had to fight my way to actually be there and the shunning that went on and it, uh, that was my mother. Oh, it's evil. It I'm, was, she was my, yeah. I was her only daughter mm. and the eldest daughter. That day will stay That's with, the, it's, of all the things yeah, that we've, ever done. horrible days we've had with these people, that for me, watching my wife go through that, mm. when we were all stood outside waiting to go in, the looks the disgraceful looks that she was given, the mm. hateful looks, the only daughter mm. of the deceased lady in this coffin, and the way they treated her on that day will stay with me for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I have, I've got over it now because I've spoken to a number of people and I had a little bit of therapy over this because I was so angry at the time at the way she was treated that day. Yeah. It wasn't, it was beyond evil and it was just the most despicable way to treat anybody and any human mm -hmm. being who's mm -hmm. trying to mourn the death of their mother to mm -hmm. and she didn't she almost didn't get a seat wow. to sit uh, inside the yeah. hall I had to fight my way as to get the a seat only daughter at the back extremely painful but uh, to be honest my I mean my the way that my parents or my mother and specifically had treated us up to that point she had made me mourn her before she died because you do when you're being shunned it is like a mourning process you 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 have to grieve it's a grieving process and it mm. you you have to come to terms with the fact that that person is no longer there they they have they don't want to be in your life anymore and that's what happened with my mother my mother had made me mourn her before she died so although cancer killed her um, the watchtower took her from me I, I, I say that the Watchtower killed my mother's relationship with me way before they took, yeah. she, the cancer took her life. It's no wonder why the statistics show why so many kill themselves yeah. within this organisation through desperation mm -hmm. and loneliness and feeling that there's no way out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why it's so important that people network with each other mm. and start to realize that they're not on their own if i'm talking to the governing body right now this is what i would say i can't get you to change your faith i know i can't do that because that's something that you will never change but what i would implore you to do 
is safeguard your children from paedophiles and change your safeguarding policy that is universal, that is harming children across the world and is exposing children to vulnerabil uh, vulnerabilities that shouldn't even be there. The policies that are in every other church are very clear and they're very sound. Yours are the complete opposite. So if there's one thing I would ask them to do is because it's destroying your organization mm -hmm. yeah. and you can't even see it. You're that naive and you're that stubborn, but it wouldn't even change your biblical doctrines to change it, but change it anyway, because it's for the, for the safety of your children. That's the one thing I would ask them to do. And if they said no, I would say, why? Mm -hmm surrounding themselves with this uh, overall um, fake I we're a religion they're not a religion they have no interest in 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 God at all and that is very clear when you step away and look back mm -hmm. you realize it's not it's got nothing to do with a relationship with what they they say it is with no. with Jehovah it's got nothing to do with it at all they draw people away actually from 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 having a relationship mm. with God, and mm. I, and that to me is disgusting. And I, how dare you do mm. that? How dare you? Mm -hmm. uh, I would suggest. I mean, based on the experiences we've had with as activists now for a number of years, what we've what one of our main intentions has always been to. A lot of people use the expression "poison the well," mm. and what we mean by that is to be fully informed. If you're going to join a high control grouping, if you're going to join uh, a, a, re a strong religious pseudo cult type of organization, before you do that, please look at all of the um, ramifications. Look at all of those that have left that particular organization before you decide to join. And then, then you're fully informed then you're going into this with your eyes wide open. And without that, you're not going to get that full information from the organization itself. Mm -hmm. It will hide it, it will lie to you until you're trapped through baptism. And then you'll find out yeah. the rough end of the stick. So always check and do database research right across the board before you actually get involved with um, an organization such as Jehovah's Witnesses, Scientology, the Plymouth Brethren, mm. all of the others, there's a whole list of them. Mm. They all have strong restrictions based on them, some stronger than others, depending on which issue you're dealing with. But they can lead to a lifelong debilitating period for you. Mm -hmm. And you can take a wrong path and make a decision that can have an adverse effect on the rest of your life, mm. leading to alcoholism, leading to um, pharmaceutical drug addiction, leading to suicide, leading to clinical depressions, leading to the death of your own children mm -hmm. through the blood transfusion issue. And it's worth doing the research before you get too involved with the glitzy love bombing of a Bible study. And we're still growing, we're still learning, we're still, yeah. and it's wonderful because the life we have now, we are, we are free and we are able to do and, and, and say and act and dress and do anything we want to do yeah. because we want to do it. And to be able to take control of your own identity, to find out who you truly are as an individual is the biggest self, it's a liberating wonderful mm. feeling and it uh, you can't explain it no. in a way that someone would understand it unless yeah. they've experienced it and yeah. to free your children yeah to free your children from that same grip that you yeah. you grew up with uh and is is priceless well, one of the first things our daughter said when we were leaving she's eight was and now i'm going to be destroyed at armageddon and burst into tears and that's something that we had never told her no. it's something yeah. she'd absorbed from just the, the going to the meetings, yeah. we were horrified. Mm. But now she's she's an absolutely blossomed, wonderful, independent young lady who doesn't even remember saying it. Really? So that mm. says to me she's completely free now, and she's yeah, she is fantastic. And to know that she's never going to be dragged into any cult-like behaviour again in the future or cult-like organisation. You knock that wall down and allow yourself to have freedom to be able to speak to anybody and build relationships with anybody your network of friends will be immense and beautiful because they'll be so diverse with so many different people mm -hmm.
not all thinking like robots the same way. Yeah. Um, and it, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. We've got so many friends who I would never have ever have made friends with before because I would have been told I wasn't allowed. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what you need to do is just build relationships. Yeah. Mm -hmm.